studies in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, all the faculty, as well as my colleagues who collaborated uh, with this event, are of course so our speakers for accepting the or invitation to share with us their exciting research uh, projects. The concept of transnational indigeneity, in the title, may seem as a misnomer, but it is actually one of the ways in which academics nowadays are trying to catch up with how some Latin American indigenous cultures are navigating today's cultural and economic globalizing currents. These very same cultures are challenging the outdated and ethnocentric view of indigenous cultures as living in the past within a certain Eurocentric conception of modernity or view as forever rooted in a specific territory or as marginalized by the dominant cultures, first by the colonial powers, then by their creo or mestizo hers in post-colonial times. Even with the exception of the few remaining nomadic or semi-nomadic groups, for example, the Yotono Odom across the US-Mexico border, to be indigenous was almost synonym with being immovable. That is why their transnational condition is so revelatory and important, not only for academics, but also for policy makers. In their transnational condition, indigenous groups may reveal that national forms of identification may not have been as inclusive or hegemonic as assumed for most part of the 20th century. Indigenous migrants, for instance, are also teaching us that cosmopolitanism is not the exclusive privilege of Westerners. And if many indigenous migrants now working in the US or in Western Europe do not really identify as national subjects, will they accept other imposed on labels such as Latinos, Hispanics, Latin Americans, do they actually prefer to establish links with other US and Canada populations, for instance, with Native Americans, than with their fellow countrymen? These are, of course, topics and questions that may not be directly addressed by uh, our speakers in the presentations, but we can certainly refer to these issues during the discussion session. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ulla Bird first, who is a prolific assistant professor at Rutgers University, and who is also a filmmaker, now finishing her second uh, documentary. Uh, she got her PhD in anthropology from uh, New York University in 2007, and her research focuses on mobility, race, class, and performances of self in the context of transnational migration between Peru and the US. She has published numerous articles in refereed journals, and she has uh, co-edited also with Karsten Paragat. Karsten Paragat, by the way, was here at Ohio State two or three years ago. He's one of the European specialists in Andean cultures, Andean migration, uh, especially. Uh, she has also collaborated, uh, or edited, I would say, uh, special issues on migration, borders, and transnational citizenship for the journals Hemispherica, Latin American Perspectives, and identities. Uh, her documentary, Waiting for Miracles, is from 2003, and uh, she's preparing one on the Peruvian poet Domingo Taramos. Please welcome Professor Julia Ferro. that this event uh, sets out for us. 
um, and that is, are some Latin American indigenous peoples thriving in the current globalizing scenario and providing us with crucial insights into the processes of social and cultural cosmopolitanism and transnationalism? And this question is provocative uh, for a series of reasons, um, and one could offer perhaps a two-part answer. The answer to the first part of the question could be uh, pessimistic and short. No, indigenous peoples in and outside of Latin America do not thrive uh, in the current globalizing world, mainly because of the ways in which neoliberal globalization with its deregulation of markets, extractive industries driven by foreign investments with little regards for a local community, the general erosion of social provisions and social injustice and violence more generally impact uh, these communities and their livelihoods negatively. And one can only uh, look to all the most recent protests um, all over Latin America about access to water, uh, impact of extractive industries, etc., to provide um, that answer. But the answer to the second part of the question, uh, that is, are their experiences providing us with cru crucial insight into the processes of social and cultural cosmopolitanism and transnationalism, is yes, and enthusiastically so, absolutely yes. Um, they're not only providing us with insights on transnational practices and, and uh, uh, vernacular and other forms of cosmopolitanism, what some anthropologists have, have, uh, have discussed, but also on the transformation of dominant racial and class hierarchies that result uh, and get transformed by transnational migration and circulation. So uh, those who are familiar with uh, Peru and its regions will know that, uh, that the Mantaro Valley, that's where I did my, uh, my field work, it's uh, in the central uh, highlands of Peru, and it occupies um, a particular and in-between space in the Peruvian social and racial geography. It's right here at Huancayo. It's the main and most um, important city. Um, and uh, I want to start there, just uh, briefly putting forth a clarification <laughs> about indigeneity and its dynamics in the specific work uh, region of Peru that I work in. So, in uh, the Central Highlands, uh, after the conquest, the colonial encomienda system was never implemented in the Mantara Valley, and some scholars have suggested that this was the crown's reward to the pre-Hispanic Huancas for having supported the Spanish army in the fight against uh, the Inca Empire. As a result, land continued largely on local hands since the colonial period, and this continued after independence because the Republican Hacienda structure was also not implemented with the result uh, that peasants in the area mostly have owned their own means of production. Like the rest of Peru, the Central Highlands suffered greatly from the devastating effects of the European invasion and underwent dramatic uh, demographic and social changes. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, sweeping ep epidemics and intensified circulation of population to participate in road construction and the building of churches and the reducciones towns through Mita labor drafts, that along with the influx of populations for the obrajes, that's sort of the colonial equivalent of today's sweatshops, right, the textile um, plants. They changed the demography and led to an accelerated process of mestizaje in this area, which blurred <coughs> previous social, ethnic, and ca caste-based categories. A uh, historian, Florencia Malan, has found that already by 1780, this area had held one of the highest percentages of mixed race population in the Viceroyalty. By the early 20th century, the processes of mestizaje in the valley had consolidated, and the imaginary Indian of the isolated, closed corporate community, who could only establish ties with the outside world via cultural brokers, had disappeared as such from uh, the Mantero Valley. However, uh, what the anthropological literature on the valley identifies as indigenous symbols, rituals, festivals, and music have not disappeared because the mestizos uh, of the valley continue developing, innovating, and recreating uh, regional cultural practices. Uh, some of them were previously exclusive, exclusively indigenous. And today, the majority of the valley uh, population celebrate indigenous rituals like the La Marca de Ganado, the branding of animals, um, 
And so, uh, the valley also has one of the most dynamic fiesta uh, systems in the Andean region, which includes more uh, than 40 different ritual dances. So uh, Jose Maria Rielas, for example, he always highlighted the Manparo region among other regions in Peru in his essay for its high degree of economic and cultural independence with regards to the dominant culture of the national Limeño elite, so the national elites in Lima. When Arguedas arrived, uh, when Arguedas arrived in Huancayo in 1928, he described the city as a typical mestizo uh, city, but where any Indian could be integrated because the city, uh, and this is a quote, the city offers prospects for all without requiring anyone to surrender their gods for admission to its premises. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was his way of characterizing a, um, an inclusive city. So the establishment of the U.S. owned Cerro de Pasco Corporation in 1901 and the construction of the railroad, which arrived in Moncayo in um, 1908, um, <clears throat> in 1908, produced an unprecedented expansion of internal and external markets, which in turn offset a irreversible wave of modernization in the valley. The railroad connected the valley with Lima and the port of Callao and with the mining areas of Guantavirica, La Oroya, and Cerro de Pasco, and Jauja, also the city of Jauja. And this next picture is uh, a historic photograph. I'm sorry, the quality is really, really bad. I couldn't locate the original, but we had a uh, bad pixelation. Uh, that's the arrival of the ferrocarril uh, to Jauja in 1908. Um, it facilitated the transport of minerals and wool from the highlands to the coast and linked the area directly to return to external markets. It also transported commodities and brought new immigrants to Huancayo, particularly North Americans, European, Turks, Japanese, and Jews from different places. In short, it served as a vehicle for the introduction uh, of new sensibilities, styles, subjectivities, and tastes. Later came the Carretera Central, which is one of the most important highways in Peru cutting across the Andes. Together, these various developments renewed the promise, not just of participation in a national uh, project of modernity, uh, but also for the inclusion into global circuits of cosmopolitanism and mobility. The history of travel, and here we have the Carretera Central, uh, going through Matahuasi, which is one of the communities that I work in. The history of travel, uh, mobility, and the infrastructures that facilitate such movement within and beyond the central <coughs> highlands is significant because it has shaped not only the identity of this region within Peru as particularly prosperous and modern, but it has also shaped the ideologies of mobility which in turn have been implicated in the historical and contemporary production of mobile practices in the area, including uh, what we could call indigenous migration today. For the rest of the time uh, that I have available, I wish to discuss what migration, mobility, and indigeneity means to people uh, in this area, and what it allows them to imagine, embody, and actualize. I'm going to use two cases to illustrate how contemporary transnational migration, whether imagined or actualized, operates within this broader history of Andean circulation, modernity, mobility, and travel. The embodiment of this particular history of travel and circulation within Peru profoundly influenced aspiring migrants' imaginations of what migration to a foreign destination would allow them to do, and it also formed their everyday practices and subjectivities in a powerful way. And I, I should say as a side note, perhaps that's the reason why I'm, I'm always trying to really include this longer history of travel is that it's not that the uh, indigenous and, and communities in this area sort of all of a sudden got launched into this transnational circulation, but there, there actually is a long history of, of relying on mobility for the, for the social reproduction of Andean life. So, um, okay. so um, the first um, case that I'm going to focus on, it's a story, it's a story of an individual with a name, or I call her uh, Ines. She comes from this town of Matawasi. And here the road uh, kind of looks like uh, any kind of road, but it is actually a highway that connects uh, the southern part of the Andes to Lima. And it runs through uh, all of these towns. 
So I'm describing here um, a conversation um, that I had uh, with Ines, and I'm going to read uh, from the paper here. Why would you want to live there? Ines asked me, astounded. She could not fathom the possibility that anyone would voluntarily consider living so far away from the main road. I was trying to find a place to live for a longer stint of field work, and I wanted to live in the more rural part uh, of the town, and she wanted me to live by the roadside. We were standing in her mother's, Doña Rosa's, sparsely equipped grocery shop in the town of Matawasi, located at the roadside of the Carretera Central, the national highway that connects the Mantaro Valley with the nearby mining areas of Morococha and La Oroya and with the capital Lima on the coast. I was looking for a place to live um, and was considering Barrio Ferrocarril in Matawasi where I had lived next door to transnational families with, with members in New York City during a prior period of field works a few years earlier. I liked that part of Matawasi because it was a quiet area at the outskirts of town uh, towards the banks of the Mantero River, surrounded by artichoke fields, plush green pastures, and tall eucalyptus, nispero, and ginda trees. Ines didn't like that part of town at all. It, could, it would be more convenient for you to stay up here, she said persuasively, and by up here, she meant her mother's home right next to the highway. Here, you're closer to Huancayo, you can get to Jauja in 15 minutes if you need to, and the bus to Lima stops right here, right outside of our doorstep. La carretera está ahí nomás. The carretera central, which was the main road connecting the valley with Lima, had been at the center of Inés's life since childhood. For generations, it was a vital life source, not just for the family's economic survival, but also for their prosperity, as it injected continuous lifeblood into a prolific family enterprise that included a gas station, a roadside restaurant, a productive dairy farm, and her mother's grocery shop. As a child, Ines had learned to respect the carretera and be careful when crossing it or playing next to it. Later, it had carried uh, the body of Ines and her two sisters to Lima when they as hopeful provincial youth coming of age in the tumultuous and politically unstable 1980s wanted to improve themselves through education and better paid jobs in the capital. The highway encoded the dreams and fantasies of Ines and her fellow provincial youth and made them feel real and full of possibilities. <clears throat> but the road also uh, evoked bittersweet memories about loss and deception. It was this road that in 1972 took Ines's father away when he followed the footsteps of three brothers-in-law and left the town for good, abandoning his wife with four young children as he headed towards a new life of his own in Miami. What was once a prosperous and complex family enterprise with a gas station, a restaurant, a farm, and a grocery shop was now a random collection of decaying infrastructure in a changing social landscape. Ines's mother, Doña Rosa, and her uncle Willie were the only two family members left on the farm. The rest of the extended family had either moved to Huancayo or Lima or to the United States, uh, and the older generation passed away. The gas station was now closed. The restaurant, once bustling with activity, was empty and displayed deep cracks on both inner and outer walls. <clears throat> Several of the neighboring farmhouses also stood empty and locked up. Their former inhabitants, Ines told me, had left for Lima, and those with more luck, she emphasized, had migrated abroad. Ines was evidently captivated by the carretera's promise of connectivity, mobility, progress, and freedom. Scholars have shown how infrastructures, particularly roads and railroads, are not just technical or physical objects, but that they operate at the level of desire, encoding the dreams of individuals and societies by representing the possibility of being modern, mobile, and having a future. Uh, Harvey and Knox, for example, analyze roads as technologies for delivering progress and development and to explore uh, uh, effective dimensions that allow roads to retain the strong yet generic social promise that they hold in Peruvian society. The notion of enchantment of infrastructure helps us understand the way in which Ines daily struggles to salir adelante, which is the term generally used for uh, aspirations to so social mobility, and getting out of poverty, most of all, uh, were deeply entangled with the animated force of the carretera as desire and promise. Uh, <clears throat> these, or in this, were ultimately bound to the desire for a better life 
which in the central highlands of Peru, at that particular moment, was mostly conceivable through migration to overseas destinations. Um, as a result of all her efforts, uh, Ines eventually got a U.S. visa in 2001, uh, and she, I've heard her talk for years about uh, wanting to go abroad and trying all sorts of, of options. Um, and she traveled to Miami. She and her two sisters had asked their estranged father, also a U.S. migrant, to petition them, and they were waiting for those papers to come through. But meanwhile, Ines was determined to get a tourist visa to await the petition in the United States and used a migration broker in Lima to help her prepare for the interview uh, at the U.S. Embassy. Aspiring migrants, especially in the post-9-11 era, put a great, great deal of effort into fashioning themselves as urban and cosmopolitan subjects to be able to pass unnoticed through elite urban spaces, and that includes U.S. embassies, because many of the folks that I <coughs> worked with were, didn't, you know, they applied, but often didn't qualify uh, for a visa via the official uh, uh, channels, and therefore had to use alternative uh, channels, and that is sort of a consequence also of increased border enforcement in the U.S. is that people are using increasingly uh, uh, false documents, all sorts of, uh, of different travel routes to arrive um, at their destinations. So. She came to the U.S. She lived for several years in a small Florida town, uh, working odd jobs, uh, uh, etc. Despite all the promises that transnational mobility encode, migration also produced entrapments of various kinds. After more than 10 years in the U.S., Ines still have no papers. She's still underemployed, struggles to make ends meet, and with a pending order of deportation, which confined her so, uh, socially to her living quarters whenever she was not out of town, uh, whenever she was not out on odd and badly remunerated jobs. She was still hoping to find a white collar job and someone to marry, and this way move out of the social moratorium of her present situation. Her son Anke had his DACA approved last year and could finally attend the, uh, the local community college in their town, but classes are expensive and they were struggling to get by. Her night table attests to the desires of Ines, who has two candles set by a faded printout of a Photoshop collage with ID type pictures of her son, Angel, and herself superimposed on a green card. Each day she prays to Diosito with the hope that he one day will listen to her prayers. For migrant women like Ines, returning to Peru with no papers, and this is where transnational circulation becomes complicated, right? Um, uh, and little or no savings to invest in a business of sorts was equivalent to a failed migration project. They could therefore not return. Instead, they continued to live in the shadows, working several jobs at once, all at low pay and scrambling to get by from day to day hoping that one day their respective papers would materialize and ironically then allow them to return home. So this is sort of the first I'm giving you the pessimistic story, but now the next one is perhaps a little more uh, uplifting. Uh, the second case that I want to present to you uh, is the case of Paulino uh, from, here we have with all the internet in Ohio, uh, because also hardly so many people have family members abroad, there's an internet uh, cafe on every street corner. Uh, Paulino, he comes uh, from a small town that I call Urcumarca uh, in my writings, uh, and now because I wanted to show you this picture, uh, you know now the name of the little town, so that's okay, it's not a trick. Um, but this picture shows the Comunidad Campesina uh, of the town, and then they have, you know, a, a huge sign with their uh, with the municipality's uh, website. Right? It's not always working, but uh, <laughs> but it's there, and it's a big uh, sign of sort of arrival into the modern era, right? For this uh, uh, for this community. Um, so for many of the Peruvians uh, that I worked with um, during my field work, migration is a cultural and class aspiration at the center of an always unfinished process of social becoming. The desire, uh, they desire not only to access middle class lifestyles either in Lima or increasingly abroad, 
uh, and to claim the cultural value attached to their indigeneity, but they also genuinely strive to reposition themselves back home as nationals of Peru. So this is where, ironically, somehow, the nation state uh, of origin <coughs> still, had a, still has some sort of uh, uh, stronghold. A recognition that they have not been able to see historically uh, in Peru itself. Now, when returning those who have papers, they are able to walk the streets and upscale shopping malls of both Huancayo and Lima when they return from the U.S. and feel that they have successfully invented themselves beyond their pre-migration social and, <clears throat> and or indigenous condition. When Paulino, who came to the U.S. Uh, uh, and became a U.S. resident, he came to the U.S. Sorry, in '89 and he became a resident. Um, in 2004. He now returns uh, to Peru to participate in the yearly fiesta honoring the patron saint of Uscomarca. He always uh, also, and that's a big deal for him, he invests a lot of money, the family invests a lot of money in the community, so these uh, transnational <coughs> fiestas, I don't know if some of you have seen uh, uh, Paul Gilles and Luisa Martinez's uh, film, transnational fiesta, they're now doing like a 20 years after uh, version that's coming out um, soon, but that is about you know, how um, indigenous migrants invest in these uh, fiesta mm -hmm. systems back home um, after migration. But now, uh, he also, he did not only return to his own community, but also uh, to Lima to visit friends and family, and to take his uh, family uh, to places in Lima that he had never dreamt of setting foot in prior to his U.S. bound migration. This aspiration to belong to a higher class strata in one's country of origin and ancestry is decidedly effective. It is truly a project of self-invention, and it's very qualitatively different from the acceptance to which migrants aspire uh, in the US, where claims to citizenship of belonging feels more strategically about aiming for opportunity, higher earnings, or equal rights. Paulino traveled to the U.S. in 1989 via the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, helped by his mother, who had uh, migrated as a domestic worker in Washington, D.C. for several years uh, with the Peruvian diplomat family. In the U.S., he married a woman from the highland community of Chongos Alto, and they had two U.S.-born children. Paulino uh, eventually was able to regularize his migration status, and as I mentioned before, since 2001, he has been able to return uh, to Peru, and he does that. He's a gardener, uh, but he's been able to uh, return once or twice a year, often during uh, the winter here. For Paulino, like for Ines, transnational migration is a cultural and class aspiration. They desire... Uh, wait. Okay. Um, in sort of very uh, new and interesting ways. And that's not 
participating in PFS, et cetera, is one way of doing it. But if you can't travel, then you have to participate in some other mediated forms, right? So there is a huge um, circulation of video. And I know our next speaker is going to talk a little bit about the, the circulation of audiovisuals. Oops. Well, I actually think I took those out. But I have some slides. Yeah, I thought I had some slides. Um, that shows you know, how these folkloric videos are displayed uh, at the market uh, in uh, how uh, and in one time you will migrants that return purchase them or family members purchase them and send abroad so everyone, also those without documents who cannot uh, uh, circulate transnationally and travel are able to participate in this sort of expanded practice uh, uh, of, um, of Andean uh, cultural practice. So just to conclude, the frenzy of international migration uh, that I witnessed during my fieldwork in Lima and Huancayo and in the small two small towns in the Mantaro Valley in, 19, uh, in 2004 um, was, <clears throat> was at a moment where our migration uh, was huge uh, in Peru. Okay. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of things that has happened in Peru. Uh, the Peruvian economy has grown exponentially uh, since 2004 and survived sort of a global financial crisis. But uh, ironically, or perhaps not as ironically, uh, that hasn't deterred people from continuing to out-migrate because many of the people whose livelihoods are affected by the sort of general erosion of neoliberal economic policies are still candidates for migration and will most likely continue to migrate no matter how great the macroeconomic figures um, look like. Uh, so um, the desire for upward mobility, upward and outward mobility was intimately tied to the ambitions of becoming modern, this is my conclusion here, and wiping off the stigmatizing and racializing aspects of Indianness and rural backwardness, um, which historically in Peru has rendered only some forms of mobility available and socially legitimate to Andean Peruvians, although rarely of the cosmopolitan and transnational kind. Thank you. I learned about the next uh, speaker from a former graduate student in our department, Spencer Portuguese, mm -hmm. who spoke wonders about uh, one of his professors from Wadi Wadi's Universidad Autónoma de Yucatán. Uh, so when I asked uh, for the name of this uh, professor, he said, uh, well, Francisco Fernandez Rafael. And when he said, Francisco Fernando Repeto, the last name, the second last name, because in Mexico we have two last names, uh, the, the maternal last name, Repeto, uh, ring a bell, no? Because I immediately remember uh, Repeto, a famous Repeto that was familiar with. Uh, so when I first met him last year in Merida, one of my first questions was precisely about this person. No, I, I asked him if. Uh, he was a relative or knew about Carlos Torres Repeto. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, 